when I was a kid, I uh, would always dig through my, I gotta take one of these earpieces out, sorry. I would dig through my uh, folks record collection all the time, mostly based on the art, you know? My, my parents probably listened to more music before I was born. I think they were kind of hippie types, you know? I actually have a bunch of my mom's records still. But um, I remember, you know, just they were at eye level as a kid uh, next to my parents' stereo. And uh, I remember seeing like, uh, Trout Mask Replica, for instance, which was probably the hippest record I ever got from my parents. That record cover was really alluring to me. And then I listened to it when I was a kid and I hated it. But, uh, you know, the first stuff that I really heard that I wanted to, that made me want to play music was ACDC, which is such a basic answer, but it's true. But uh, even as a kid, I was always curious about, you know, the world of it, you know? Yeah, I mean, ACDC, you know, might be basic, but it is just... I mean, they were my favorite band for so long that I almost can't even listen to them anymore. I've been like every now and then, I'll, every now and then I'll revisit, but I, uh, I, I, uh, I flooded myself with all of their records for so long that uh, I just, it's like uh, I don't eat a lot of candy anymore either. But it's like this memory, this fondness of it, you know. And it definitely put me in the direction of wanting to play guitar, you know. And and was that was it like seventies ACDC that you were listening to? Or? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that Bon Scott, I mean, even some uh, Brian Johnson stuff, Johnston, Johnson. But uh, yeah, it, it was, uh, I want to say it was maybe uh, For Those About to Rock was the first record that really uh, piqued my want to play guitar, you know. Oh, no. And then also, uh, what was the live one with the guitar sticking through Angus Young? Again, that was just like the record cover, seeing it with the, him being stabbed with the guitar was the live record, which I can't recall the name of right now. But um if, yeah, I mean, you want, if you want blood, you've got it. Yeah. I mean, they're all, they're all good, but yeah. And like, you know, even like Thunderstruck. I yeah. Think <laughs> you can't go wrong with ACDC. You know, I never got to see them live though, somehow. It's unfortunate. Uh, that's, yeah, that's a shame. Cause they, they, their live shows look epic. And so it made you kind of, that, that was an early thing that made you want to pick up a guitar. When did you start playing guitar? Uh, when I was 16, my parents bought me a red Charvel, like pointy tipped heavy metal shredder guitar. That was exactly what I didn't want. But at the same time, it was the first guitar I had. So of course I used it to death. Um, I took like two lessons and I've never been really one for uh, learning. Like I was terrible in school. Just, I just like floated by. And it was the same way with guitar where I didn't, uh, I still can't read music for instance, uh, which is ridiculous. I've accidentally fallen ass backwards into knowing things like chords and shit after 20 some odd years. But uh, I didn't play for a long time after after that initial jump in. Uh, I think it was probably drugs, you know, more than anything, and moving out of my parents' house in the exciting world of being on my own. But then, one of the music started coming back into my life pretty heavily around twenty, and uh, then I started picking up a guitar again. By then, that Charvel had been stolen, so I went <laughs> out and bought myself a uh, Melody Maker, an old Gibson, which I still have actually, and. Uh, just started jamming with people all the time. And that was, that was how I learned was just jamming, you know? And to this I, day, that's still a tool for me. It's just to play with people to get better, you know? And like, so when, when you went in and just started jamming with people, you know, like how much prep are we talking that you'd done beforehand? Like none. I was, none. I remember being like yelled at by my friends, roommates being like, you know, you guys are terrible, which was true, but we would, <laughs> I think I, part of what I was doing when I was really young that I still do now is repetition. You know, we would repeat and repeat ad nauseum a riff. We would find a riff and play it for an hour. So it's no wonder uh, my friend's roommate, she had had enough of it pretty quickly because we would get together week after week and play um, the same riffs over and over again without a drummer. And then uh, eventually I met a drummer and uh, things, you know, uh, picked up slowly piece by piece with each added member of the band or the jam band. And, and uh, so after ACDC, you know, what, what were kind of like your formative influences after that? Well, then I got really lucky. You know, my whole musical career has been so much uh, just being in the right place at the right time. And uh, I, my friends started getting into skateboarding and I kind of always followed my friends. Like they joined Boy Scouts, so I joined Boy Scouts. Even though I loathed it, I like became a scout just so I could hang out with my buddies, you know. And skateboarding was a big thing when I was a kid. It was, you know, the 80s. And I sucked at that. I still do. I can't surf. I can't skate. But uh, I did that. And because of that, there's that whole culture that came along with skateboarding that was like punk and metal. 
Um, I remember I really loved metal and that I kind of got made fun of for that because that was pretty square then uh, in terms of my friends that were into punk. But there was a little tiny record store that I can't remember the name of, but it was a, just a cassettes only shop in the 80s. And I went there and it was a guy and a girl that owned it. And they, I would be just be in there lost, like digging through the racks and they'd be like, you know what, you should listen to this. And they turned me on to uh, The Cramps, which I remember taking home. Same thing with The Misfits, two bands that I took home and uh, didn't, didn't understand it and felt kind of uh, not into it, but couldn't stop listening to it. And then I realized that's sometimes how things grow on you is um, it's not necessarily your cup of tea, but you, you sort of become a little bit obsessed with it. And then of course I started, you know, I get to see the cramps live when I was really young because they could, would come through Providence every now and then. And uh, that, that store had a huge role in my formative years of music. And then I had a friend, Robbie, who I'm still friends with, who gave me my first drugs proper and uh, turned me on to things like Can and uh, even stuff like like Yes. Like he was really into like, uh, he was really into kraut rock, but also very much into like elaborate stuff, like really over the top stuff with uh, orchestration and shit, which was a little bit too much for me as a young man, but now I love that stuff. So I feel like the seeds were planted for things like prog rock and orchestral rock and, and even like Renaissance rock with this guy, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, like, lucky. I, was, I was just listening to some OCs before, and I like some. There, there, there was some stuff in, in there that just reminded me a bit of Yes. Like, I'm a huge Yes fan. Yeah. yeah, I love Yes. I even like '80s Yes. I'm I, at this point, I'm 45, so it doesn't. It doesn't. I have nobody to impress, so I can like all the uh, guilty things that I've been hiding uh, as a I young man. Lonely Heart is one of the, you know. Yeah, <laughs> that I remember the video for that. You know, I, that was like MTV was just coming up when I was a kid, and that was. That was my introduction to them before my buddy started. He was like, no, 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 no. You got to hear the good shit. And he played yeah. me like, you know, uh, other early stuff. You know, they have a lot of records too. There's a lot to dig through with that band, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and their records are like, you have to really sit down for them. They're not like, they're not like a simple pop record to listen to. It's sort of an obligation, you know? Yeah, you've got to, you, well, some of them you've got to give a, a few lessons. I mean, but that's Some said, of them aren't for me still. <laughs> yeah, like... But then some of them have like the harmonies are pretty uh, easy to like to get into. Like I've seen all good people, or, you know. Oh yeah, there's tons of uh, pop in in that. Like same thing with King Crimson. You know, the stuff that always grabbed me with King Crimson was the stuff that was really far out and had you know the, the whole band was really going for it in a really like sort of out there kind of way. But at the same time, there's a sentiment and a thread of pop in it. You know, and that's I've always liked. I even like my metal with pop. I loved Iron Maiden. And even Slayer, I would say, is weirdly kind of poppy because it's still, you know, verse, chorus, verse, and it's catchy, even though it's heavy. You know what I mean? Like that that pop element, even in uh, noise music for me, I've always been constantly digging for the sense in the uh, chaos, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that like heavy music is always, well, I find it more accessible, you know, being... It's, I mean, sometimes we call it in the band, we'll call it uh, like bonehead when, when the drummers are like, all right, I'm gonna play a real bonehead beat or like, uh, you know, just like a, like a, just a dumb beat. And that's to me, like, you know, those halftime beats are what get the crowd moving a lot of times, you know, like these parts you get all like fantastical and uh, complicated, but really the hook that people a lot of the times are looking for is that pop bit, you know, yeah, the bonehead sure. bit of a song. <laughs> <laughs> and so when, when was the, like, you, you kind of started just jamming and like- Yeah, I mean, I didn't have a real band for years and years and years. I, uh, the first band I had was called Krang and that was with Jeff Rosenberg from Pink and Brown. And I had met him, I was working at a coffee shop in Providence and he was going to Brown and he would come and get coffee off me in the morning. And we somehow started talking about music and he was helping book shows at Brown. So he opened up my world to a lot of stuff too but I found a sort of kindred spirit that I could start playing with. So we, we were doing like acoustic guitars together and then sort of graduated onto like, you know, by being around the scene in Providence, which is quite small, I met other uh, players and sort of started coveting drummers and whatnot. And, you know, that band didn't go anywhere. We played a handful of shows, but it was my first taste of like being terrified on stage and uh, being in front of other people and opening up for a band that you would really dig. You know what I mean? Like we opened up, I think probably for Lightning Bolt when they were very young, like stuff that was kind of mind blowing and really a turn on and uh, an inspiration. I got, I got real lucky there too, you know? And, and 
how, like at that stage, you know, was it was it very, like quite sporadic gigging, or, or were you and and playing? You know, did 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 you move like as you got more passionate? We did definitely you... practiced a lot, and we were actively looking for shows. I don't know if our band was anybody's cup of tea at the time, really. So it wasn't like they were pounding down the door, but it made me go out to a lot of shows, and we practiced incessantly. Like I still have demo and rehearsal recordings from that band with guys that I, and girls that I haven't seen in fucking 25 years you know so wow. but you know it was a gradual uh bob from revolver always said to me uh slow and steady wins the race and i took that to heart where i was like just you know stick around keep playing and eventually you'll learn how to do it and maybe people will dig it you know and and when, when was your first like experience in in a recording studio um i think we recorded that band krang we did some some demos with Dan St. Jakes, who's the singer of Landed, and he was in Oneyville Sound System, and the Dehydrogen Terrors in Providence, real Providence dude. Another person who taught me almost everything I know now, like he was definitely like fertilizer for my brain to not give a fuck on stage. He would fight or uh, get beaten up at, at our shows. I ended up joining his band Landed, who are still around, but he, uh, he recorded us on a cassette eight track, I think, which I'm not sure if I still have that or not. I, it's too, it's too, uh, too much and almost a bit embarrassing for me to listen to that really early shit. You know, <laughs> it was pretty indie rock. We were still like finding our way, or I was finding my way. Well, who, you know, what kind of stuff I wanted to play. But I mean, I stand by it, but it's just hard to go back. You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've you've done. A hell of a lot in i don't even want to hear my record from last year frankly like i'm always looking forward to the next thing to playing with more people or you know trying to innovate or even just improvis imp improvisation to accidentally f stumble into something new and exciting for me you know yeah i mean well that's that that's really good to hear and, and, and inspiring but i mean <laughs> When, when, when people when, ask me when, what my best record is i'm always like the next one the next one you know the last one was garbage you know you got to move forward yeah, well, that's, 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 the sign of it. that's the sign of an artist, really, always wanting to move <laughs> on to the next thing and not being content, you know. Well, being genres. writing and, and uh, keeping busy and working on something keeps the wolf from the door, I think, both mentally and, uh, and financially, even like, you know, just constantly trying to not stay relevant, but like keep myself occupied, especially right now with the way things are. It's, uh, you know, I have a lot of friends who don't have access to the things that I have, like, I have my own studio so I can go fuck around whenever. And it's, it's tough to watch people be, uh, be lonely or, or just bored right now, you know? These are people that are never get bored either, but they're finally like running out of projects because this has been going on for so long, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, I mean, are you missing playing, playing live? Yeah, a lot. I mean, I've been doing okay, but I'm finally getting a little cagey. I'm, I've, I mean, I have, I'm gonna have like 10 releases after this year. I've been sewing up all these projects. So. I've been really busy, excuse me, but uh, but I'm definitely missing, like my phone will remind me that I was supposed to be in Berlin last month, for instance, like our tour schedule will pop up on the phone every morning. So you wake up to terrible news in general, and then it's all like Paris, and you're like, fuck, you know, like, or the UK, you know, I'm just like, oh, I'm supposed to be in uh, in London right now or in Ireland, you know? So it's, uh, yeah. that's, that's a little bit grueling. I'm definitely ready, but, you know, you got to be realistic too. There's not much you can do right now. What are you going to do? You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, are you are you optimistic about uh, about the the return of live stuff? Like, I, I fucking hope so. Out. Yeah, because a socially distant show to me just looks terrible. Awful. Yeah, like it looks like a poorly attended show. And part of what we engage with the audience now is really physical, like people being able to touch each other and stuff. And I hate the thought of the handshake or the hug going away because of this, you know? I mean, we've, yeah, as, really a, as a human race, we've faced shit like this before. So, you know, like people weren't wearing masks after the Spanish flu 10 years later, you know? It's just a matter of, I, you have to remain hopeful right now because otherwise it's too, the, the, other, the other way is too depressing for me to think of yeah. You know, okay, so there'll be a circle on the floor and you have to stand there and you with this bubble on your head and you can't have any drinks or whatever, you know, it's, I, yeah. I really love the life that we've made for ourselves. I love touring. I love traveling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's... everybody does. I think <laughs> all the people in bands are feeling the same way right now. They're like, everybody you know, we, 
people are yeah like when something happens right now something even as small as like i know a guy this week a jazz drummer who's just going to play on his front porch and he wrote me and he's like if you want to come by and just watch from the street i've invited a bunch of my jazz friends and i was just like something that sounds great i was like i would love to just sit in the dirt of a median and watch you play drums man i'm all about it you know like the community is resilient and i really hope that uh you know I, I'm guessing the Russian vaccine is not going to be great, but I think a vaccine and probably antibody testing are going to be our two major focuses for determining how we move forward. Not even the COVID test, but just knowing whether you've had the antibodies or not and, and perhaps a, a safe and feasible uh, vaccination would be great because I don't have polio for the same reasons, you know? Yeah, I mean that. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't mean to bring up COVID right away, but it's just so prevalent right oh, now. It is prevalent, it's, and it's good. Yeah. It's good to talk about it, and like you know, all all the episodes that I've been doing recently have have you know focused on it at least a bit of course. because it, it because it is it is really important, and it, it it is affecting musicians. I mean, they they did a socially distanced gig in the UK in a forty five thousand um, kind of seater or An arena capacity like stadium or or arena or whatever. And um, they got 2,500 people in there, all on little um, buckets. I mean, you, of yeah. course, necessity will make up what, what dictates the future. But I love a small, hot, sweaty show where there is somebody who's drunk and has to be removed from the show. You know, like I, exactly. these, these are the things that I'm familiar with, you know. It would be, it would be, yeah, it would be terrible for it to die out. But, you know, I do, I do kind of show Our band you. would suck spread out like that. Like, <laughs> we can't. <laughs> We can't uh, overcome that uh, that challenge of being like, all right, everybody, don't <laughs> dance. Fuck, I'm sorry. You know, like I don't really know how would we how would we deal. I can't imagine I feel like OCs being like a like a kind of picnic. picnic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we could do a mellow set, I suppose. I don't mind doing a sit down show. I have nothing against that. I just feel like, you know, a lot of the energy that we reap from our crowd and then it is reciprocated is that sort of high stakes like. Uh, the crowd is an ocean, you know, like an energy source, not just people sitting scared far away from each other, you know? Yeah, yeah. As if people weren't neurotic enough. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a great thing to just like walk around seeing people wearing masks. And, 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 and I mean, it is a good thing because everybody should be. I just got back from the store. This is, uh, I, all I know oh, is my, oh. neck, my neck has been sweaty for a month now because it's hot as hell in LA, you know? Yeah, but you gotta do what you gotta do. So, so in so going back to your um, like the the kind of like genesis of your career, like what was the kind of turning point um, for you? Like when did when did you first find kind of success? I mean, I had a job up until probably ten years ago, and then this has become my job, which is really fortunate. I mean, we put in a lot of work, but we've also been, you know, just. I think tenacious and uh, and a bit lucky, but I would say probably when I was able to finally not work a job, turns out without having realized that that was my dream all along was to not swing a hammer or stock shelves or ride a bike all day. These are things I, I've done every kind of job, you know, and even when I had a job, I would always work the most minimal amount so that I, cause I didn't want to work. I wanted to work on my own projects. So when I was on a painting, uh, crew, for instance, the uh, the boss would be like, who wants to go home early? And I'd be like, me. And everybody else would be like, this fucking guy always wants to go home. And I'd be like, I don't want to fucking be here. You know, I was like, if I can make 40 bucks a day, I can live on that. I can eat tacos or rice and, you know, drink cheap beer or whatever. Um, yeah, it's the, the dream for me. And when I felt like I started to make it per se was just not having to do work for somebody else, you know, and be able to, uh, farm out work to other artists to like being able to afford to pay somebody to paint a record cover you know just this this again with the community sense but uh that was it for me not having to work at a grocery store or be a bike messenger i was like yeah and then also convincing my mom when i bought a house i was like i bought a house and she's like well shit i guess you really are a musician i was like yeah, it's only been 20 years so, <laughs> and like cool. how long how long had uh, um how long had OSB's been going by, by the time that you were kind of able to pursue music? Like That was cool. probably close to the end of the sort of first, the, the seminal lineup, which was Bridget, 
Mike Schoen and Petey Dammit. Like, um, I wasn't really working at the end of living in San Francisco. On and off, I would do a gig every now and then. But, you know, I would say, fuck, it's hard to pinpoint, like, what, what album would have been the one. It, also, we were just touring constantly, you know. So that touring, really, if you're playing shows and people are showing up, you will make money. And I pay the band equally so if you play a show with me after expenses you get what i get paid so everybody was on the same page so ideally for me making it too a big part of that was not having to have my fucking drummer have a day job where he's not accessible to me so i need them on call like to suddenly be like okay we're gonna write for a month and they're like all right you know like they're they're sitting there waiting also you know these guys are always wanting to write so i'm pretty fortunate with that but uh you know just not having a job for everybody is bonus you know i'm sure anybody would feel that way nobody wants to dig a ditch you know <laughs> unless you have to dig a ditch I and, and, and people who who want to do something as like it is really hard work doing things like touring so so touring oh, yeah. organizing tours writing music you know making your i've had to moderate so much of my life to accommodate a touring schedule like we had like with you know drugs and alcohol even things like just getting enough sleep now I'm getting old you know so I can't like stay up all night but also like waking up and going for a run and, and like having some sort of exercise on the road and trying to stay healthy uh you know much like working health for me was always like I want to be healthy but in the most minimal sense of the word I want to put in the least amount of work and get just over the margin of healthy enough that I'm alive to do the thing that I love yeah but uh yeah touring is exhausting it's not for everybody I know a lot of great bands who hate touring a lot of amazing geniuses there's so many people on our label of the years that we've done records for who don't do tours to back up the records, but it's like nothing is worse than somebody who's miserable on the road. It'll bring everybody down. And it's just, you know, you can't force that on somebody. It's like you wake, people like waking up comfortable in their own home, not exhausted, not hung over. Um, you know, I like, I always like the Pat and Oswalt bit about, uh, being in a band for him was just like working at a moving company. He was like, we just move all this heavy shit and then play for nobody and then put all the heavy shit back in the truck and then move it back and then move it into the practice. And I was like, that's exactly true. You know, it's like, you just, that's, that's part of your exercise regimen on the road is just picking up a heavy thing. Yeah. That's why I bought bigger amps so I can get a better workout. <laughs> and, and so when, when you were first like making it, how many gigs did you tend to play a year? I would say we did at, at, well, we were the most busy. It's not like that much, but it's enough that you could feel it. But it was like three months out of the year, probably solid with sporadic flyouts for festivals. So we would do the States for a month and then usually Europe, the UK and Ireland for a month. And then uh, maybe once a year we would go somewhere special for us, which would be like uh, Asia or Australia. Like we went to South Africa a few years ago. Wow. And that's how I was hoping to proceed, which would be to do Europe, UK, Ireland proper, the United States, and then have one tour where we would sort of rotate, um, you know, somewhere special. Like we're always hoping to go to the Baltics again. We had such a good time in like Macedonia, Serbia. I want to go to Russia. I've never been. Uh, Japan's always a blast. Thailand's amazing, you know, just to go to. Like I always felt like you're really lucky if you go and play somewhere and nobody's at the show, but you get to travel to China for free. You know, you just go see a place because my, my folks, my parents never traveled anywhere. So it became like such a huge part of my life to like not get stuck in Providence. You know, I love Providence very much and I'm excited to go back all the time, but I want to see the world before I'm dead. You know, South Africa, like Cape Town is a, an incredible place. We just like hung out on the beach. There's like penguins and shit and really good people tons of great food the shows were fantastic that's exhilarating to me you know yeah i think it's uh it's well it's what most sane people would describe as uh, living the dream I, I would yeah my say. sister is a she works at a restaurant and she recently worked at amazon for a while and uh, i think i've told the story a million times but it's quick and true where i was talking to her on the phone and i was complaining about something and she was like oh fuck off dude she's like i serve the same people the same food every day she's like I don't want to hear it. She's like, you're bitching to me right now from Paris. And I was like, you're absolutely right about it. What a, what a tool thing to do. So. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I have to agree with her. <laughs> yeah. She, it's the only time she ever told me to fuck off. So I took it to heart and I've managed to not piss her off again since then. 
But I mean, at the same time, you know, it is, uh, it is ex exhausting touring. And it, it's what is really like admirable about, about your career is like the, the level of persistence and the level of like relentlessness in terms of like, you know, you've made, you've made a record pretty much most years, right? Every year from what I can recall. But I mean, that's all I do, you know, like right now, I seriously, I wouldn't be surprised if I had eight or nine records by the end of this year that were coming out on various labels and various monikers because the fuck else am I going to do right now? I've been painting a bit and like, you know, you can only, you can only stare at me and my girlfriend. She's working from home right now from uh, she's working for JPL, but she's able to do a work from home. And it's like, it, it takes a lot to be together 24 seven. We've been together for 10 years and it's something that I've never, uh, we've never had to do before where I'm like, am I driving you crazy? She's like a bit. Yeah. So <laughs> we're, we're, we're figuring it out, you know, but uh, right now I'm just staying busy. I have my own studio, like I said, so I can go downstairs and I've been pretty good about uh, not procrastinating it. I've been having a lot of fun with improvisation too, playing right before the shit hit the fan with all this. I had done hours and hours of tape with different bands um, doing improvisation. So I was bringing people here like different drummers and stuff. So I'm going through a lot of that stuff now and calling out, all the stuff that's workable and then editing. So I just, I just finished a record last night that was like a month of editing and it came out really good. I'm really happy with it. Oh, nice. But I was really glad that I had this material to fuck around with while this was going on, you know? So will this all be released under different kind of monikers? Well, this OCs has, I don't want to ruin any surprises or piss off my partner at the label, but we have a handful of releases coming out this year, mostly on my label, one, two on two other labels i don't want to give too much information away but there's a lot of season material coming out it'll give the critics plenty to bitch about they're like they're putting out too much and you're like well just don't pay attention anymore look away but um but also other bands like uh, i have this record coming out right now that's had a couple singles called bent arcana that was an improv record with these guys from new york mostly fantastic players a couple dudes from here this girl lena playing violin it's just a really it was it was dumb luck. None of these people really knew each other, and they played together. And I got them all together, and they were I selected them because they were that good, and they were so fucking good in the room together that I was just chuffed the whole the whole time. And then I have other people that I had worked with material that'll be sort of like ECM record label style, where the names of the record is just the people who played on it with a title. So it's overly complicated for today's short attention span, but really enjoyable for me. And I guess that's all that matters in the long run that I've enjoyed. Well, working on these projects, you know? Well, I'm sure a lot of people will enjoy them, but I mean, have you, be, have you been taking to heart the advice of, uh, what's his name again, Daniel Elk or something? Is he Daniel Elk? The CEO oh, yeah, yeah. of Spotify. He said, he said uh, somebody complained about the, the royalties that people get from Spotify, and he said, oh, well, artists better make some more music then. I'm making tons of music, ton of which will be available. Hang on, my dog is, that's, that's my dog, uh, buddy. Hey! the hell are you doing <laughs> yeah he's a he's a very loud hound dog um so i love i love when spotify gives advice they're like hey we've set this precedent for low pay to artists you're like thanks spotify what else do you think i should do but that being said i do i've i've rather than try and fight digital music i've totally embraced it in fact yeah. people who approach me are having stole a record off pirate bay and they're like sort of apologizing at the merch table i'm like don't worry about it it's fine like at this point we're headed into the land of free music, in my opinion, anyway. Chances are I'll be dead before that happens, but there's no reason. You can't really fight this shit. It's too big. So that being said, I'm, I'm banking on people that love vinyl and that people that support the band, which has, been, which has been great. Like during this, we've actually, I think, sold more than usual on things like mail order from our label because record stores were closed. People are bored. A lot of people in the States are getting stipends from the government. So they're like, you know, I'm going to buy a bag of weed and some records or whatever. So yeah i feel like yeah i'm gonna have tons of digital material coming up but i'm always about the physical release i love lps you know i love playing a record i always have even that's goes back to being a child and just being obsessed with things like molly hatchet record covers being like what the fuck is this yeah then yeah. being slightly disappointed when i actually heard the record but still you know <laughs> what i mean like the physicality of a 12 inch by 12 inch piece of art with a like a plate inside that you can play the record off is pretty cool to me so i love and so do, so do you, do you collect vinyl? I have, a, I have a disgusting record collection. I never used to. I, I traveled pretty light, but now I would say, since I bought a house, I have a problem. And I, but I, I, I call, I go through a thin the herd, I make sure I'm not sitting on anything I would never listen to again. 
And usually I'll take those records and trade them for records that I do like. I also have a huge digital music collection. Like I have hard drives full of music. So I like, you know, on the road, I like having, I don't like streaming very much because I find it not reliable for me personally. Like when I'm in Europe, my phone is just a pain in the ass. I don't, I don't want to be on my phone all day listening to music. So I'll, I'll bring like, I got like an upgraded 500 gig iPod that has like 300 days of music on it. And that's like my whole record collection in my pocket, you know, but it's also sort of archaic at this point. Like everything is moving so quickly. It's hard to keep up things. Uh, every day there's a new thing that you have to understand, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Imagine being a kid right now. Jesus Christ. Oh, well, it would be not great with the- uh, I just watched yeah. cartoons. <laughs> yeah, it, was, you know? it, it, it was great. That I, I would not like to grow up like today on social all of media. my bullying happened face to face when i was a kid which now i can respect i feel like my bullies will contact me be like hey do you remember when i punched you in the face at the time i'm like i do and you know what I'm, I'm appreciative of that because it's better than being anonymously bullied online by some asshole <laughs> you know uh, they have it tough man i feel i feel for really kids do. now they really do and and so so of your um lp collection um because the, the final question that i always like to ask people is you know who, who are your greatest who are the greatest artists of all time? Because that's the sort of tongue in cheek. I mean, it, that would that would be a hard question to answer because I love so much, but I can always say that, I mean, I am a disgusting can fan. Like I even bought a scrapbook off some German guy on eBay that had all the original articles about them in German just because I, they're like uh, can and uh, I mean, Krautrock had such a huge influence on me, but also, you know, jazz. I, I fucking love Ornette Coleman and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll dig in on anything, but then also, there's, there's, there's a simple grapes too. Like, the Beatles and the Kinks and ABBA, you know, it's like sometimes popular music is popular for a reason is it's actually that good. It transcends the bullshit of being, um, you know, uh, basic or uninteresting. But yeah, for me, it was always about can. Like I just actually sent out uh, to a bunch of my friends a Dropbox link with 10 and a half hours of can bootlegs I'd collected over the past few years. And like wow. a lot of people are like, thanks like like what the fuck would i want 10 and a half hours of this band i i kind of like and these terrible recordings of them and i was like to me this is like you know the holy grail but uh but i mean it's it's a tough question to answer too because i love i love so much music i really do it's like saved my life basically i would have been a total prick if it weren't for music i think <laughs> and i'm a bit of a prick now so it's only partially <laughs> saving me you know no 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 music has definitely saved you john um, <laughs> and uh, and so um and of, of the LPs in, in your collection, are there like any particular favorites? What I do is, they're all in alphabetical order because so I'm a bit inattentive, but um, I mean, I have some prize stuff. Like I think, let me think of the most expensive record I ever bought was Moondog Heart Songs, which is uh, like sort of like German, European era of Moondog that's got singing on it. It's fantastic, but the record is like, 150 bucks and i remember when i spent 150 dollars on the record i felt like throwing myself off a building because i remember i never thinking i would spend that kind of money but i just had to own that record you know what i mean like there's there's a few records but they're i mean we're talking like you know monetarily uh important records just because they're expensive which is a dime a dozen now records are extraordinarily expensive but i have some like cool um a lot i love bootlegs i have some great roxy music bootlegs like the uk put out tons uk and Italy do all these fucking great bootlegs. So it's like Alice Cooper band or Roxy music in 1973, like just, just with like hand drawn art on the covers, Pink Floyd, tons of, uh, tons of bootlegs, you know, just, I love a bootleg. When we were in uh, Japan, I went through a store that just, I think I bought like $200 worth of bootlegs. I was like walking out the door with all these inevitably terrible sounding records, but they had like a huge beef heart live, like the magic band wow. bootlegs. I was like, my bandmates were like, what the fuck are you doing? I was like, I can't stop. Like, I was like, I want to take all of these home and like go through each one like, and find the good ones, you know? Sounds like I love a live show. Place. That's yeah. cool. God, that would be great to visit. Well, John, thank you so much for taking yeah, the time to do this. It's been Cheers. awesome. And uh, yeah, be well. Yeah, be well too. I hope, hope you're back on the road and traveling and playing music soon. I will hopefully be just beaming into someone's living room before then and then be sweating on stage in a pair of shorts ASAP. I'm super ready, you know? Yeah. Take care out there. Take care. Bye. Yep.